Great Sunday morning. It's Pastor Paul Anderson here at the Fountain of Raleigh Fellowship, where we believe God's blessings never stop flowing. It is halfway through the year. We're right at the first Sunday of July. We have seen so much that has happened in terms of the weather, the tropics, and all of the other storms and things that have been happening in people's lives. But, you know, it lets us know that we're at the halfway mark. All of us need to take a moment to assess ourselves to find out where am I in this year? This year's half gone. But guess what? It's the other half in front of us. Are you planning for the future? Are you considering what God has in store? You know, God has so much in store for all of us. And today, as you and I begin to open up and examine God's text, we'll find out that there's a word for us that tells us even when we go home, that can be a challenge there. So today, I invite you to come with me as we go into the presence of God and experience his presence on today. May we pray. Gracious God, we say thank you for blessing us to be here. Thank you for allowing us to have have this moment to engage in dialogue. Speak to us, Father, as we're speaking to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What an awesome day it is, an awesome time in our lives as we begin to think about the greatness that God has done for us all. You know, we as a country, the United States of America, I, I'm residing in Raleigh, North Carolina. We had an opportunity to celebrate our country's independence. It was a time when we as a country decided that we wanted to break away from quote unquote England. We wanted to be an independent country, a country that had a democracy, a country that did not have a king or someone that we reported to. I remind all of us that we have been so blessed in this country to have what we call an electorate, those persons who get a chance to vote and elect people to serve for a limited period of time. You know, I'm so grateful that we have a constitution that was designed in such a way that it will allow us to live in a civil society. As you and I come off the heels of this Independence Day, let's always thank God for the independence that he's given to the United States of America. And may we do all we can to ensure that that we live up to the tenets of the Constitution of the United States and that it has worked for all these years, I'm sure it will work in the future. You know, one of the things that we do know is that God's word never changes because God tells us heaven and earth will pass away, but not a single one of his words will pass away. I don't know about you, but I'm so grateful of the ministry and the life of Jesus and what he does for all of us and how Jesus came into this world. God in person, Emmanuel, God with us to give us instructions about life and about living and to make sure that we understand there's more to life than what we see because there is eternity. You know, today, I hope you and I will begin to think about the longest period in time that is eternity. Today, I invite you as we come into the presence of God and as we share it with one another, let's look into the inspired word of God. Today, I invite you to look with me at Mark's gospel, the sixth chapter, verses one through 13 from the New Living Translation. It's a powerful text. It's a text that Mark writes to us and he gives us the scene and the setting is that Jesus is now returning to uh, the region of where he was born into his home country. And while he was there, it is so amazing that the text unfolds and it tells us even though Jesus was God in person, he didn't do a whole lot there because of the faith of the people. And today, let's look at it and let's hear what it says. Mark the sixth chapter, verses one through 13. Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. They asked, where did he get all this wisdom and power to perform such miracles? Then they scoff. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and his sisters live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe him. Then Jesus told them, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. I want to share this portion of this pericope, this, this lesson that comes to us, and I have entitled it, Ain't No Place Like Home. 
ain't no place like home. Let's pray. Father, we ask that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart will be acceptable unto thy sight. Thank you, O Lord, for being our strength and our redeemer. And we thank you that your word will go forth and accomplish the thing wherein to you have sent and shall not return unto you void. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Ain't no place like home. You know, anytime I think about a no place like home, I can't help but think about the Wizard of Oz or the Wiz. I don't know if you have seen the most recent Broadway production of it, the Wiz. It is just awesome. You ought to go see it. But in that Dorothy says something as she clicks her heels. There's no place like home. I changed it into my vernacular. Ain't no place like home. You know, home is that place where everybody remembers us. Home is the place where uh, hopefully we've had a nice, nurturing and warm environment. Home is the place where uh, we have our siblings. Home is that place that we can feel comfortable and at ease. And when we are not comfortable and at, need, at ease, it means we need to do something different. We need to mend our relationships. We need to make sure that those who are in our household, we're all on the same page. Our text on today is very intriguing to me because it lets us see that Jesus is now returning with his disciples to Nazareth, the place of his birth. Ain't no place like home. You know, every now and then I get the opportunity and I hope you will as well, if time permits, to go back to the place where you grew up. I know many of us, we can't do that because our cities have changed. Many of them, our communities have changed. They have turned over. We now go from where these little homes were that all these McMansions and all the other things about home life has changed. But it is always amazing that even though the geographics change, sometimes people's thoughts and concepts of us remain the same. It is important for all of us to realize and give ourselves license and opportunity to grow, to explore, to experience life, to make sure that we are nurturing ourselves to become the best person that we can be through and by the help of God, through our education, through and by our exposure and experiences. A text lets us see that Jesus, who is Mary's baby, true, who is the one who grew up in Nazareth, according to the prophetic words, we now see that Jesus has returned home with his disciples. Now, Jesus has done great miracles all over. He has done so much. He has healed the sick. He's raised the dead. He's cast out demons. And now Jesus comes to the geographical region where everybody knew him. Ain't no place like home. I don't know about you, but when I grew up, uh, in my small community, uh, everybody didn't call me by my first name, but they call me by my middle name. You know, it's amazing how we have names that people call us as we're growing up. And then when we mature and go out in life and, and become who, what God uh, would have us to be, people know us from a different perspective. But it's always amazing that whenever you go back home, people remember who you used to be. Have you ever dealt with the challenge of somebody reminding you who you used to be, who your parents are, your humble beginnings? Our text on today lets us see that Jesus and his disciples go to Nazareth. It's the next Sunday he goes into the synagogue and he starts teaching. This is so powerful. Jesus goes to the synagogue as it was his custom and he starts teaching. Remember, even as a child, where did we find him? In the synagogue. His parents were looking for him when they were on a pyramid, when they were on a pilgrimage. Where did they find him? In the synagogue. Jesus knew the importance of being in his father's house. You know, that reminds all of us. It is important for us at some point in times in our lives to come to our father's house, God's temple, God's home, God's place. You know, we find out in the New Testament that God doesn't dwell in buildings, but he dwells in the hearts of believers. But he tells us never should we forsake the assembling of ourselves together. I know many of us since COVID, we have not gone back to church and and I'm so happy you're watching me through this live stream, this platform that we have. It gives us an opportunity to reach people all over the world, even though that is so important to all of us for us to build a connection. We still have to always have interaction with people. You know, have you ever thought about it? If you had all the money in the world to do whatever you want to do, most of us would do something with interaction of other human beings. 
Jesus is now interacting with those who were in his neighborhood. He is in the temple. He goes to the place where the scroll is being read. Now, remember what would happen in their day. Somebody would read the scroll, one of the priests. And then after they have read the scroll, they would put it down and there would be an exposition. There would be an explanation of the text. It is from there we begin to see how we get so many commentaries of how people commented on what the word of God has to say and its application in our lives. Notice what happens with Jesus. Jesus is right at home. He is sitting in the synagogue. He is teaching and he is preaching and everyone is baffled because they cannot understand where did he get so much information? Where did he get so much wisdom? Where did he get so much knowledge? You know, that causes all of us to pause for just a moment. We must remind ourselves there should always be some growth in our lives. Notice, we must always understand that Jesus was God incarnate. Jesus was God in the flesh. Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us. They had no idea when Mary gave birth to this baby boy. They knew it was a fulfillment of prophecy, but they fully didn't grasp to understand the gravity of what was happening with them. You know, sometimes you and I, we don't understand fully all of what's going on. So we come to our own conclusions, which are sometimes limited. You know how it is when we see people who have moved away and they've done something and they come back Many times you and I, in a derogatory way, we say, oh, we remember you when we try to bring you down. You know, oftentimes when people go back to their communities to say, hey, I'm back. I want to make it better than ever before. And people ask the question, who do you think you are? How, how did you come to this place where you can make life better for us? It's amazing how even when God elevates us, people try to bring you down. Our text lets us see that Jesus is now teaching in the synagogue. And, and as he's preaching, they say, how did he get all of this knowledge? Jesus, we know you. We remember you when you were a little boy. We know your Mary. We know your Mary's baby. We know Joseph is your father. Well, the truth of the matter, Joseph was his earthly father. But we find out that Jesus is the one who was God in flesh. Mary experienced what was known as the Immaculate Conception that God overshadowed her with her spirit and she became impregnated with God's son. Joseph was his earthly father. Jesus was always with God in the beginning of time and even in this point in time. Look at the text. The text says that as he starts teaching in the synagogue, they heard him and they were amazed. They were astonished. They said, oh, Jesus, look at all the growth that you have experienced. Wouldn't it be awesome in all of our lives if people can look at us and say, look at the growth you've experienced. You're not the person that you used to be. You're moving forward. You're becoming better. You understand that life is bigger than the small world that we started in. Well, well, Jesus has to expand them in their thoughts, in their actions and in their deeds. Notice they're so amazed and they ask, where did you get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles. Well, you know, oftentimes you and I are like the people in the text. We forget about the power of God manifested in his son, Jesus the Christ. Well, Jesus did all of these miracles because he had the power within him. He had the power to do all of these things. But notice Jesus is only able to do what he has given, quote unquote, permission of the people to do. You know, too often times you and I, we forget that God wants to do great and marvelous things in our lives. But God never forces himself on anyone unless we make ourselves available. You notice in the text, we find out that many times you and I are not available and we have no room for God to do great things in our lives because we like it just the way it is. Oh, what a dangerous situation to be in. When we find ourselves limited, when we find ourselves not willing to grow, when we find ourselves not willing to expand our horizons to hear what God has to say, that's the reason we have to engage in Bible study, Bible reading to find out not just what's on the surface of the text, but to get deep down to figure out what does God really say? Well, the text, they hear Jesus and they find out he has great wisdom and he performs powerful miracles because he is God in person. 
That's the way he's able to do it. They couldn't figure it out. You and I need to remind ourselves we have a limited understanding of God, a limited expansion of life. And because we're limited, we sometimes limit God. Ain't no place like home. How many times you and I, we find ourselves when we're around our family, they remind us who we used to be. They remind us of the child. They remind us of our birth order. They remind us that we're not the elder, we're the younger. They remind us we're the older and not the younger. You know, it's amazing how family can put you in awkward situations. You know, that's the reason why it's important for us to make sure that we know God as individuals and we share God's love with our family so our family can fully understand how God encompasses us with unlimited power and potential. You know, you and I have unlimited power and potential if we make ourselves available to God. Notice in the text, it says that, how did he perform all these miracles? Verse three, they scoffed. They said he's just a carpenter. They tried to minimize the power of what Jesus had. You know, too often times in this life, when God is trying to use us, people try to minimize us. As we see it in the world in which we live, how people are oftentimes trying to minimize other people to make themselves look greater or to be magnified. The last time I checked, the Bible says we should magnify the Lord. We should make sure everybody know how great God is. God does great things through us, but we serve a great God. Here they begin to say, well, Jesus, he's just a carpenter. No, he's more than a carpenter. They only saw him from one perspective. They only had a small portion of his existence on earth. And from there, they tried to derive a conclusion. He's only a carpenter. I hope you and I would never say that about an individual to put limits on them. Never put limits on our children. You know, we're into the summer months. We should not put limits on our children. We should take the limits off. We should take it to a whole new level. Let's encourage them to read more books than ever before. Let's encourage ourselves to expand our knowledge, our information, to remind ourselves wherever we started, we don't have to stay there. I'm so happy in the United States. We don't have a caste system as it is in other countries. You know how people are relegated to only be in a certain socioeconomic strata. But in the United States, we're able to rise above that. That's the reason why education has been made public and available for all. We must caution those who are elected officials who think that education is only for an elite group of people. Take public money and put it to private funding of institutions and giving children scholarships. No, we must make sure that we fortify that we give our public education system all that it needs. The United States was built upon a country that is able to help people to grow and become better and to have greater and higher aspirations in life. That's the reason why we exist as a country. We must remind ourselves, the text reminds us that we cannot limit people nor limit their potential. They said, Jesus, you're just a carpenter. They try to take him back to his humble beginnings. You know, it's important for us to go back home to see where we've come from and and to realize that even when we go back home, people think about who we used to be, but we got to let them know there's been a transformation in our lives. Look at the text. They say, we know Jesus. We know who his mama is. We know who his daddy is. Ain't no place like home. When you get home, everybody remind you of who you were as a child. Oh, I can remember and I, I have I have it vividly in my mind when I go home and people who haven't seen me for decades and knew me as a little boy. They knew that I was always small. I was one of the smallest kids of all of the ones that are around. They had a lot to do with a lot of other things and we won't go into all of that. But they call me by my middle name and they used to call me Little Leon. That's Little Leon. You know, my parents gave me that name, Leon. I tell people it's French, it's Leon. (laughs) You know, it's important for us to understand that people try to belittle us. They try to take us back to where we were as a child. Jesus lets them see that, no, I'm more than a carpenter. You really need to know who I am. Jesus is the son of God. He is God in human flesh. And notice as they say this, they begin to scoff. They begin to make fun of him. They say, no, he, he's not all of that. And the text says 
that they were deeply offended and refused to believe him. Jesus is rejected by his own neighborhood. You know, it's amazing how sometimes you and I find out how when God has done things for us, there are still people who will reject us. There are some people we need to understand you can never please and we should never try to. You know, the Bible tells us it is important for us to please God. You know, when we start pleasing people, we're in the people pleasing business and God is not always glorified. Look at the text. They rejected Jesus, his hometown. What an awful thing to have happened. You know, people who saw you grow up and now have seen you become more, they reject you. They reject him publicly. They reject him on the inside. There are people who hear the good news of the message of Jesus Christ. They reject him. But you and I need to make sure that we create the environment that they receive the goodness of God because God came in human flesh so that you and I can see and believe. Notice what happens in the text. It says that Jesus begins to quote an Old Testament prophet, uh, uh, Old Testament message. He said a prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and among his relatives and his family. You know, it's amazing how people always remind us of our humble beginnings, but they forget that we have grown up. Today, I want to ask you the question, have you grown up? I have to ask myself the question, have I grown up? Have I grown in my faith? Have I grown in my knowledge and love of the Lord? Well, Jesus grew up. He came into this world as a baby, but as he grew, they saw who he really was. He was God in flesh. Now, Jesus does miracles everywhere, but when he gets to his hometown, he says that he could not do a whole lot of miracles because of their unbelief. That lets us see that when Jesus does miracles, he does it with people who will believe. You and I sometimes, because of our disbelief, we have limited ambition. We have limited aspirations. We have limited expectations because of our unbelief. Jesus is telling them, I need for you to believe. Too often times you and I don't believe. And that's the reason why we find ourselves in the dilemmas and the situations that we're in. When we begin to believe that God has power, when we begin to believe that God is doing great and wonderful things here at the fountain, we always tell people when folk ask the question, how are you doing? We say that we are exceedingly and abundantly blessed because we know in Ephesians 3 and 20, it says now unto him who is able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you're able to ask, say, or think according to the mighty working of his power within us. It is the power of God working within us that allows us to be able to expand, to grow. Jesus couldn't do a whole lot of miracles because of their unbelief. And notice what happens because of their unbelief. It doesn't mean that the message stops. You and I have to keep on preaching, have to keep on teaching because it lets us see in the second portion of this pericope that Jesus sends his disciples out. He sends them out because he realized there was only so much they could do at home, but the world was there ready and waiting to believe. You and I cannot allow ourselves to be stifled simply because when we get around people who know us for what we used to be, sometimes it's hard for them to see the change in our lives. That's the reason we have to broaden our horizons. We have to move to new neighborhoods. We have to move to new communities. We have to move to new places in our minds and our spiritual growth to let everybody know I'm not the person that I used to be. You know, I used to not understand why sometimes people move from one neighborhood to another neighborhood. But now I very clearly understand it because sometimes you have to change your environment to change who you want to become. Doesn't mean we leave home. We remember home because ain't no place like home. Home is the place that begins to be our cradle of theology. Home is the place where we've been nurtured. Home is the place where we've been loved. But home is the place that you and I should be given an opportunity to grow. The text lets us see that Jesus sends his disciples out. They don't just stay in Jerusalem. They don't just stay in Nazareth, but they have a bigger picture of life. You know, God reminds all of us we need to have a bigger picture in life because God wants to do great things in us and with us and through us. But it's impossible if we have limited faith. I want to remind you, take the limits off. Yeah, ain't no place like home. 
That's the place where we first met God. That's the place where we had our nurturing. But we must learn to move away from home. It's great to go back and visit, but we have to be in a bigger place. We have to be in a place in God that God is saying, I need for you to grow. I need for you to become more. I need for you to allow my spirit, my power to be at work in you. You know, it's amazing how God is able to enlarge our territory. The prayer of Jabez talks about enlarging our territory. We must make sure that we remind ourselves that our God is bigger than you and I ever would have imagined. See, the people in Nazareth, they had a very small view of life. Today, I want you to have a bigger view. Let this second half of your year become bigger and greater than it ever has been. You know, here at the fountain, we remind ourselves that we're coming up in December will be our 15th year of ministry. And for that, we've already started planning. You can't wait until December to say, let's celebrate. You have to plan before it. You have to put things in place. It's the same way in our lives. If we want to grow, if we want to celebrate, if we want to do the things that God has called us to do, there are certain little things that have to be done today. The first little thing is to accept Christ as our Lord and Savior, to say, Father, forgive me of my sins, come into my life and save me. And then not only do that, we invite you to email us at join at the fountain of and say that I've received Christ and I want to join in fellowship. I want to join in learning how God can grow and use me to become bigger and better than I ever would have imagined. And then secondly, email us at prayer at the fountain of Raleigh to say, I want you to pray with me as I grow. Today, we want to pray with you. We want to know the answers. We want to find out how God has answered your prayers. But, you know, as you plan for something bigger, as you plan for something greater, you have to have steps that you know you have to take to get you there. You receive Christ as your savior. Then you engage in Bible study. Then you learn more about the faith. Then you share the faith. And the Bible teaches us that Jesus and his disciples, they started at home and then it went out. You and I have to go out and share the good news of the gospel. And it ain't no place like home. That's the place that we get the warm, fuzzy feeling. But we have to leave home as Jesus left home here on earth because he had a heavenly home in where God is. Today, you and I must remind ourselves it ain't no place like home down here, but it ain't no place like home up there. And because God has prepared a home for all of those who will receive him as Lord and Savior, it is our responsibility as disciples of Christ to share the good news of the gospel, to share it in such a way that we love God and we love people because we want you to grow. We want you to know life is bigger and God has a bigger place for us. That place is called heaven. That place is called eternity. But in the process of growing down here to get to eternity, there's a whole lot of good we can do. I don't know about you, but I've enjoyed all the good we've been able to do as a fellowship. I thank God for the growth that I know and I've seen in me personally and the growth that I've seen in so many others that are here. <clears throat> Today, I invite you, receive the goodness of God. Receive God's love, God's salvation and grow from this home down here. Ain't no place like home and realize there's another home in heaven. Ain't no place like that home. So between the two, let's do the work. Of sharing the good news of the gospel, Jesus sent out his disciples. He said, don't be concerned about who people say you used to be, but be concerned about who you are now. May all of us say that I am a new person. I've been transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. My life is no longer the same. I'm better than I have ever been. And for that reason, I'm expecting better things from God. There was a lady who taught me this phrase. She said, good, better, best. Never let them rest till your good becomes better and your better becomes the best. Well, Jesus has the best thing in store for all of us. And that is for us to know him, to serve him, to love him and to tell others of the goodness. Today, ain't no place like home. So let's get ready as we not only visit our homes down here, but let's get to that great home up yonder. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we say thank you for allowing us to be together. Thank you for this wonderful text that speaks to us about eternity and about our presence. Give us a greater expectation 
a greater anticipation of the things that you're about to do. We make room for the miracles that you're about to perform. So God, have your way in our lives and we'll be so careful to give you the praise. We pray for those all over the world who have experienced calamities and disasters. We pray for those locally who have had personal situations. We pray for those who don't know you, God. We ask that they will come to know you. We pray for our brothers and sisters in the faith that we'll all grow and become more and more and better and better than what we have ever thought we would be. So God, we surrender our lives to you and we say thank you. And Lord, we ask your blessings upon these, your people. Now unto him, the great shepherd who gave his life for the sheep, may the Lord preserve and keep you. May he bless you from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. May he bless you in your leisure, your labor, your joys and your sorrows and give you bright hope for today and tomorrow. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. 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 Take the Lord with you everywhere you go and always remember it ain't no place like home. To sow a seed to the Fountain of Raleigh Fellowship, visit our newly redesigned website, thefountainofraleigh.org and select sow a seed from the homepage. Also, giving has been made easier with the new Fountain of Raleigh app, available now in the Apple App Store and Google Play Store. Download today, select giving from the main menu, and then follow the directions to complete your giving through Subsplash. Thank you so very much for all of your gifts and donations that you've given to the Fountain of Raleigh Fellowship. We thank you for what you've done in the past, what you're currently doing, and what you will do in the future. Your gifts and donations helps us to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only locally, but throughout the world. Thank you again for your gifts, and may God continue to richly bless you. It is here at the Fountain that we believe that we are exceedingly and abundantly blessed, and may you receive those blessings that God has in store for you. Okay.